opposed to the book of Acts and Acts chapter 28. Um, and this evening, as you would have heard from the reading by our brother Christian, we're going to be looking at um, verse 17 onwards to, to verse 17 to verse 28 of Acts chapter 28. Now, if you have been around for the last uh, few weeks, I think last two weeks now, you would have heard me say that as we bring our series in the uh, book of Acts to a close, um, and we have been in Acts for quite a while now, I'm not sure precisely how long, but I'm sure it's gone into a, a year plus at this point. Um, and as we bring this to a close, that I wanted to take the last chapter and Luke's last journal of how the apostles finally arrive at Rome as uh, a, a, almost a summary of the entire book or a summary of some of the major themes in the book. And the reason for that is because as Luke, make some final notes about what took place uh, on this final leg to Rome. He, he touches on and he, he pauses, it would seem, to make specific and take specific notice of just issues that if, we, as, if we've read the book of Acts correctly, he has been prone to bring up and prone to address as being important in giving a fair representation of what life, life was like um, in the first church and how the Spirit worked in the first church. So um, uh, we, 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 we've been looking at it that way. And, you know, the f two weeks ago or so, I, as I indicated, spoke about how the book of Acts indicates that Jesus's or, or the miraculous power of Christ was in the life of the church. And, you know, there's a, there's a, in, in this last chapter of the book of Acts, Luke notes another one of the great healing acts in the book of Acts, right? There's, and th these are interspersed throughout the book, God's uh, Christ healing activity. And then last week, we looked at the church itself and how one of the important themes in the book of Acts is the nature and the existence of this new community that you call we call the church, and how um, Luke is intentional about painting for us and reminding us that in continuing to work on this earth through his apostles, the Lord Jesus Christ, his his um, his primary means of working uh, is his church and the primary work he begins to do through his apostles is establish, lay the foundations of the church. Well, this evening, it's, although it's quite a, a, a tricky subject, I think, maybe somewhat difficult, it is a subject that once again occupies, I think, a significant enough amount of the book of Luke for us to say that it's one of Luke's major concerns. Um, and it's a major concern of the New Testament. Uh, I guess the question you ask is, how is it a major concern for us? And Christian, make sure you tell that person I heard the bell. Um, the, how is it a major concern for us? It's because, um, because and, and you will see when I indicate what this is, how... That can be a difficult question to ask. We, we don't have some of the literal, um, we, we're not in some of the literal situations, you might say, that the first church was in. But without a shadow of a doubt, this occupied a lot of their concern, not just in the book of Acts, but also in the rest of the epistles. We see this coming up over and over again. And it's the relationship, you might say, between the old and the new covenant. Um, or you might say the relationship between Israel and the rest uh, 
of the nations, the Jews and the Gentiles. It's, that's a, a, con, a concern of the New Testament. Um, and if, we don't, if we're not grappling with that topic, then it's, probably that, it's likely that we're not grappling faithfully with the New Testament itself. So today I want to indicate, I want to just draw your attention again to some of the major ways, some of the ways in which it's a primary concern for Luke, then ask the question, what's the significance for us? Um, you know, we, m- many of us don't come from um, a Jewish background or come from attending synagogues and then being offered this gospel that wants to transform the way we have been doing religion. You know, many of us have probably never been concerned, faced any rejection of, um, of the Jews or Jewish nation because of the way we preach the gospel. And so there's, there, is some, there can be some disconnect there. But what, what you cannot question is that it is an important subject in the New Testament. If you pay close attention to the book of Acts, then you will agree that... Uh, Luke continues to deal with this issue right through the book, the rejection of the apostles by the Jews en masse, the um, rejection of the apostles and their message as as being um, from God, Um, the persecution they face because they claim, they make the claims they make about the gospel and how Jesus Christ is the Messiah, Um, the attempts to accuse them of scandalizing their Jewish heritage and the scriptures in particular the accusations of them being heretics, and then the rebuttal of the apostles that they are, what they're doing is proclaiming the true faith that you find in the Old Testament. They're proclaiming the very fulfillment of those scriptures that you read in the Old Testament because the fulfillment is in Christ. So this is a very important subject in the book of Acts. Now here in chapter 28, as I say, as Luke is bringing his record to a close, he takes note of this Um, this occasion, when Paul arrives in Rome, one of the priorities for Paul, one of the things he does is to call, verse 17, the Jewish leaders to himself. He wants an audience with as many of the Jews as he can in Rome. He's concerned for them. He wants an audience with them to be able to share the gospel with them and to call them to believe in the Messiah that is promised in the scriptures which they hold. So, and, and Luke records that. Luke records how Paul has this Jewish audience. And he records in little bits those things that have always permeated the exchanges between Paul and the Jews, the, the, the little questions about whether they were authentic or not, the, the doubts the Jews have, the fact that ultimately some reject Paul's message. In fact, a lot of them reject Paul's message. The fact that there was always a, there was this trajectory in the book of Acts that always basically said that in light of the rejection of the Jews, God was opening the door to the Gentiles. The gospel was going around the world. All of those things are present in this, um, this short part, short section of the book of Acts. And so, as I say, it, it reminds us that this Jew-Gentile relationship, the understanding of what you call progressive revelation, um, old and new covenant, what we're to do with the Old Testament, and so on and so forth. Those things, for Luke, are a primary thought. They're vital in, in communicating clearly and effectively the message of this new faith. They're vital to understand where there is um, departure from the old and where there is... Um, fulfillment in the new, and where there is continuity and discontinuity. Those things are vital. In a faithful presentation of the gospel, those things are vital, vital for, for grappling. You have to grapple with them. Well, let me draw your attention to a few things and a number of things that um, we, we can summarize. They're, they're indicated in chapter 28, but I, I'm referring more to what I think is Luke's mind and, and what is present, I think, in the entirety of Luke's writing. Um, first thing you see is that the, this new faith, this new community, the Christian faith, the church, is not ashamed of its Jewish roots. It has these Jewish roots. 
So it's important to say that whatever criticisms we make about the Jews, whatever uh, rebuke there is, whatever, um, whatever way in which the Bible is clear to portray the unbelief of a lot of the Jews when Christ arrives, the Bible is not anti-Semitic, for example. That's not the point. This is a spiritual thing, not an issue with the physical race. The Bible doesn't deny that, right? Paul says in another passage, right, um, is there any advantage in being a Jew? Is there any special advantage? Paul says, absolutely, in every way. Because the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. They had the words of God. You see, the, the scriptures were not given, and the, the, the preserving of, not, of the scriptures were not given to every country in the world. They weren't given to every people group. They were given to a particular people. They were given to the Jews. And the scriptures are not ashamed to testify to that. Um, and these Jewish roots find themselves chiefly in the election of God, in God's free choice of those whom he will save. God always says, the Bible always says over and over again, that God, God says, I didn't choose you because you were a mighty nation. I didn't choose you because there was anything special about you. Right? It was of my own free grace. And that's how God chose to work. Humanity deserved to be destroyed. Humanity deserved a perishing. And when God would, humanity deserved to perish. And when God would, when God ordained how through human vessels the gospel will come into the world, he chose the Jews. He chose the Jews. Right? And Christianity is not ashamed of that. And some advantage accrues to them because of that. The, the only thing is that the, the apostles wanted the Jews to take advantage of the advantages they had. The advantages you have is, look how close you are to having the scriptures. You have the word of God. You're not like the pagan nations. Take advantage of these advantages. But be sure that just being Jewish will not save you. Your ethnicity won't save you. Um, there's nothing wrong with, there was not, there's nothing wrong with the fact that you're Jewish, nothing wrong with acknowledging the way God works uniquely in the life of the Jews. Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and David. It's how God chose to work. And Jesus, we, have, we acknowledge that. But just being a Jew alone won't save you. It's like the Lord our Jesus Christ said, who is my brother and sister? Who is my mother and father? The ones who do my will, right? And so, so the Christian faith has these Jewish roots. In fact, it tells, Paul tells us later on in another passage how, how, how he longs for his, the Jews. He's, he, he longs for his people. Even in this passage, Paul arrives in Rome, and the first, to the Jew first was Paul's principle because he reckoned with the way God had worked in human history. And he was proud himself of his origins, and so the first thing he calls together all the Jews, let me present the gospel to you first because I, I, love, I love my people. And so that's one thing is to be very clear, regardless, although there is a lot of criticism on, of the way, because the Bible is just being honest, of the way the Jews respond to um, the, the, the message of the gospel, it's not in any way to deny the roots of the faith and how they have their roots in, 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 if you want, in Judaism. Another thing that this, another theme that is significant in the book of Acts and that present here, but present through the book of Acts and that, that Luke is really concerned to um, emphasize and to make sure that we have entrenched is, is the authority of the Old Testament, of the Old Testament scriptures. And so when Paul is in debate, when he's in conversation, in argument with, with the Jews, who, who, who claimed that this was a new sect and that was changing the faith and denying the things that God had said. One thing for one, for one, Paul reasoned on the basis of the Old Testament. So you notice that in verse 23, Paul arranges to meet with the Jews on another day, and after they have done this, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses, 
and from the prophets. So Paul was preaching the gospel to them. Paul wanted to, he wanted to teach them about Jesus Christ. Where did he do it from? He did it from the Old Testament, from the Old Testament scriptures. Um, and so Paul would always defend himself from wrongdoing. In fact, when they begin his plea with these folks in Rome, he, the first thing he says is, I have not done anything wrong. I haven't done anything against our people or the customs of our fathers. Imagine that. For Paul, it's a thing where he's saying, I, I, I'm not one who, I don't question the authenticity or the authority of the Old Testament. Paul never intended, and the apostles never intended, to form a group or develop an institution or a faith that would deny that all scriptures are God-breathed, even the Old Testament. And so Paul reasoned from the Old Testament. Later on, when he preaches well, his, his message to the Jews, when the ones who reject the gospel, his message is from the prophet Isaiah. And in every way, they affirm the authority of the Old Testament. This is all scriptures. All of it is God's word. And that's why it's a false claim. It's a false accusation. That's why um, it's a false claim that this Christian faith was trying to abolish the Old Testament. That the Christian faith denied the Old Testament. No, it, it proclaimed its fulfillment. And that's the third thing. Although the Christian faith and the message of the church was not to abolish the Old Testament in the slightest, the message of the church is built upon the Old Testament. Although that's the case, the message of the church, of, the, of, the new, of, the, of, the, of, of God's new community does Inc include the abolishing of the old covenant, right? So, but, and, you know, in one, in one sense, those two words can be the same. But in the way that where they're popularly used today, by test Old Testament, we're referring to the Old Testament scriptures, the book. By covenant, we're not referring to the contents of the book. We're referring to the ways in which or by which God worked. Elements of the ways by which God worked with and through his people in the Old Testament. And element of those ways, because they were types and figures that have found their fulfillment in Christ, some parts of those ways have been abolished. Now, incidentally, Paul was not even the kind to necessarily deny those, those elements. You see, those elements that Paul knew were abolished by the new covenant, he would still practice them because he just thought they have no intrinsic, they're not wrong or right. They don't, I'm not doing it because I think this is a way to be right with God. Many times he was doing it to appease the conscience of the Jews. So remember how Paul, he got one of his fellow workers, he had got them to be circumcised. Even though Paul did not believe that circumcision was any more the covenant, the, sorry, the, the sign of the covenant. Um, and other times he would, he would, he would do his, he, he, would do, he would preach in the synagogues. He would, he would reason with those folks in the scriptures in the synagogues, in the temple. Because even though Paul clearly no longer believed that the, the, uh, the temple was God's house per se, even though Paul knew God's house is everywhere where God's presence is, he was, he, he knew he, there was nothing wrong with being in the temple and discussing the scriptures. Nothing wrong with it. So, so even though Paul was like that, what this new covenant, this people, what they did usher in was the obsoleteness of the old covenant. That's where the persecution came, I think, from the Jews. Because whilst Paul never told the Jews that they needed to stop getting circumcised, he did tell them the, 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 the implication of, of the presence of this new people was that it was not necessary. It's not necessary for salvation. How? Because now they were offering the gospel to the Gentiles and asking them to be baptized, but not to be circumcised. Although Paul did not teach that the Jews had to leave the temple if they, when they became Christians, if you wanted to keep on worshiping in the temple, he did teach that this new community did teach that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the sacrifices, the old covenant sacrifices. So what's going to happen then with that which was the very foundation of the temple? The sacrifices, they'd become obsolete. So the presence of this new community found, 
built upon the foundation of the apostles, indicated the obsoleteness of the old covenant. We are no longer under the old covenant. The old covenant, in one sense, has been abolished because it's now fulfilled in Christ. The Gentiles are no longer under the law. Right? And so, it doesn't matter. The Gentiles can meet with God even though they're not allowed into the temple, into the inner sanctum of the temple. But they can still meet with God because in Christ and through Christ, they are welcome into the Holy of Holies. And this was the thing that I think got the first church persecuted. It was the familiarity that they were willing to have with the Gentiles because in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. In the old covenant, yes, there was separation, segregations that had to be made by way of obeying the shadows, you know? But now in the new covenant, Christ is the one who makes you clean. And it's, 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 it's the blood of Jesus Christ that makes one clean. And it doesn't, there's no need for any, um, no need for any outward, well, any of the, many of the outward uh, signs and symbols that were given to the old people of old. That truth, that truth of the obsoleteness of the old covenant, the old covenant has passed away, is something that we find dealt with again and again throughout the New Testament. Our Lord and Savior was the first to actually hint at it. And he started to speak about how he fulfilled the law. He was the first to begin to hint at it. But, you know, Paul especially develops it. You find it in Romans. Um, and you find it in Galatians. And you find it in Colossians. And you find it in, in the book of Hebrews, right? This is an important. We are under the new covenant with Christ. The fourth thing is Christ, the fulfillment of the law of, of all scriptures. So, yes, the Old Testament is abolished. But it's abolished because... It was always just pointing to something and someone greater. That someone is Christ, and Christ has come. Paul says at one point when he's talking to the Jews here, he says, I've been, I'm in chains because the Jews oppose my ministry. I didn't do anything wrong, but it just, they, they oppose my, they're the ones that have made me have to try and appear before Caesar. I don't want to press charges against them, but they've accused me of, 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 of doing wrong. However, Paul says, it's interesting because all I want to do is proclaim the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel. That's what Paul says. Proclaiming the hope. Um, for this reason, verse 20, Therefore I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing these chains. Jesus Christ is the hope of Israel. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the scriptures. All the promises for salvation taught in the scriptures are fulfilled in him. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is salvation in no one else. Christ is the fulfillment of the scriptures. And, you know, as I said, I read earlier as well, when Paul was going to reason with them, he opened the Old Testament and taught them about Jesus Christ. He opened the law of Moses and taught them about the law of Christ. He opened the prophets and taught about them about Jesus Christ, the great prophet. Christ is the meaning. He's the key. He's the one that the Bible is speaking about. Christ is the one who the Bible is talking about when we read the opening story of creation. Christ is the one the Bible is talking about when we read about the fall and when we start to seek a redeemer and someone to repair the consequences of the fall. Christ is the one that the Bible is speaking about when we see the brutality of Cain and Abel and Eve begins to long for a man to replace the two she had lost so that she calls Seth the one appointed. It's Jesus Christ and on and on and on. Christ is the one when Noah saves the world through an ark. It's about Jesus. Christ is the one that we're reading about when Abraham is called to go to a land which God would show him and promise that his seed will be greater than, uh, than, 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 than all the sands of the earth and all the stars in the sky. It's Christ. You read Abraham. And you read uh, 
Isaac and Jacob, and you read the wholesome story of Joseph, and you're reading about Moses, and you're reading about Joshua, and you're reading about the judges, Ehud and Samson, and you're reading about Barak, and you're reading now about Samuel, and you're reading about David, and you're reading about Elisha, and you're reading about Elijah, and you cannot understand these verses unless you are understanding how they are just pointing to Christ. He's the fulfillment of the scriptures. And the last thing, so so far I said Luke wants us to reckon with the, the, the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. It's not something we deny. The authority of the Old Testament. The obsoleteness of the Old Covenant. Christ as the fulfillment of the law. But also, this is, this is the more... Is, is the more difficult thing, and um, you, you read it as warning for us. What's the application for us is some kind of warning. But essentially, it's a seriousness of rejecting the gospel. Seriousness of rejecting the gospel. When all is said and done, the picture that is painted of the Jews largely in the book of Acts is one where, first of all, it's not true that every single Jew rejects Christ. The apostles are all Jews, right? So that's not the point. The point is that a large number of them reject him, reject the gospel. And once again, they bring us to that place where through the Old Testament scriptures, we're warned about the seriousness of rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. They, they They were just like the Jews with Moses coming out of Egypt and saying, we long for Egypt. For the leeks and the onions and the garlic of Egypt, we want to go back. They were just like the Jews of the Old Testament, murmuring and complaining so that so many of them were struck in one day. They were just like the Jews of the Old Testament, building a golden calf for themselves to worship. And all in all, even for the Jews who had the scriptures, there will be no salvation apart from the gospel You know, and very often, there's a juxtaposition here of Jews and Gentiles. Here are the Gentiles, God-fearers, they refer to sometimes, some of them, who who, who, they're, they're seeking to understand the truth. They're seeking to know more of the God in the Bible. They're not like the Jews who have been raised in these doctrines, raised in these truths. But when the gospel comes to them, they receive it. And God baptizes them with the Holy Spirit. And now, where those Gentiles are, there the temple of God is. Because where the Spirit of God is, his temple is there. The temple of God is, the presence of God is. And then he's juxtaposed with the Jews, querying and doubting and rejecting the Messiah that they killed. And so there's a seriousness of rejecting the gospel. Paul closes his conversation with the Jews here. He closes it by quoting the words of Isaiah, you know, after Paul had wrestled with them and he saw the obstinacy, the stubbornness, the unbelief, Paul says, quoting Isaiah 6, go to the people and say, verse 26, you will indeed hear but never understand, and you will indeed see but never persevere, for, the, for this people's heart has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you, says Paul, that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. If the Gentiles, if the Jews will not listen to the claims of the risen Messiah, if they will not put aside their prejudices, put aside their unbelief that comes from an unwillingness to be convicted by God's truth, if they won't surrender to the pleadings of the apostles and the conviction of the spirit then they have no salvation only jesus christ can save a serious thing to reject the gospel to reject the gospel is to bring a curse upon oneself to reject the gospel is to remain blind to reject the gospel is to continue to have ears but you cannot hear eyes but you cannot see for your heart to grow dull numb empty It's a serious thing to reject the gospel.
And Israel is a picture of that to us. And unbelief is a serious thing. Well, let me close by saying this. And I, I, I close by wanting to say, well, what's the significance for us? But I imagine that even in the words I've said thus far, you've already gleaned some significance for the church today. Right? One is the, the power of the Scriptures. We must know the power and authority of the Scriptures. And quite quickly, I, I say this, that we cannot, we must not engage in presenting, offering a Christianity that denies that the Old Testament is God's Word. Now, we must wrestle with it. We must work carefully at interpreting and trying to see how it points to Christ. We must avoid certain errors and so on. But the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi, is every bit God's word as is Matthew to Revelation. The God in Genesis to Malachi is the same God that never changes in Matthew to Revelation. The God in Genesis to Revelation is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He does not change. These are his words. Difficult Verses in the Old Testament, you say. There's difficult verses in the New. Peter says that. One of the verses, one verse in the Bible says there's difficult verses in the Bible. So we must recognize the authority of God's word. We, we cannot live a life where we only find encouragement in the New and not in the Old. We cannot live a life where we only see God's authority in the New and not in the Old. It's not faithful Christian living. Another thing, quickly, I will say that this flags up. I think the... In the entirety of the New Testament, the engagement between Jew and Gentile flags up one of the most important uh, Christian doctrines and practices, the, the, the subject of Christian liberty. As the first church is forming and growing, those questions begin to arise. What, should, how, what are some of the things that, are there things that the Gentiles need to do to be right with God? Do they need to obey certain parts of, of the law? Because these things were so sacred to us. How can they not keep a Sabbath? How can they eat all kinds of meat? How can they not engage in certain washings? How? How? How can they not wear certain garments? These questions, because they were so precious. And you know, from that forms, um, through these quandaries, through these arguments and debates, through these crises, the Holy Spirit inspires the glorious doctrine of, of Christian liberty that we are justified by faith alone in Christ's work. And because of that, we are doing nothing to earn our rightness with God. Now, the fruit of justification is sanctification, a life lived to the glory of God. But in that life, only what God commands needs to be obeyed. And if God says that the Old covenant is obsolete. The old covenant must not be enforced on new, the new covenant believers. And if God says that what causes you to sin is not what you eat or drink, we must not make up laws that God has not given. And God is able to inform the conscience of his people. And sometimes God will allow for one of his own to do something because their conscience is at peace with doing it. And it's not a sin, of course, in and of itself. It's not a fruit of, it's not a work of the flesh. But it's something that they conscientiously, they feel the liberty to do, while another Christian does not feel the conscience to do it. And this is fine. And you must not judge or condemn each other. And, but you must live in accordance with a good conscience before God. And, the, and issues of Christian liberty, and you know just how important those issues are today in the life of church. Every church continues to wrestle with that. The only thing they must realize is you don't have any laws now telling you that this is what you should do and not do. Don't touch. Don't. You don't have those laws. What you do have is a law of love. So sometimes, even though your conscience allows you to freely do something, you might with, with, refrain from doing it because the greatest law of all is to love my neighbor. And if my liberty is going to offend my brother or sister's conscience. I would rather not do, not enjoy my liberty than bring them harm. That's an important issue for the life of the church. Again, the exclusivity of salvation. Salvation is in Christ alone, through faith alone, by his grace alone. Don't add to it. For the Jews, they were trying to add all kinds of things in the, in the first church. But if Christ is the Savior, what is that? I mean, how about the angels? How about circumcision? How about the Passover? How about the Sabbath? 
Paul says, these things are not saved. Don't add them as a requirement for salvation. Sometimes in our world today, it's other things. It's baptism. Some people say you have to be baptized to be saved. Now, a Christian must obey the command to be baptized, but baptism does not save you. And we must make sure we don't add to the requirements for salvation. And the last thing is the glorious plan of God in salvation. Right? When I spoke about the Christian faith having Jewish roots, think of it like this. Our, the salvation we experience today, that we enjoy today, has roots in God's plan in the ancient Near East thousands of years ago. When we read about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, we are reading our story. The story of our God. This is, without denying the importance of necessity, of, of, of ethnicity and the goodness of necessity, the church is the Israel of God. We are God's people. God is leading us. And he who began a good work in us is faithful to complete it to the end. Amen. Well, let's close tonight by singing our last hymn, The Power of the Cross.